Good evening. I hope you've had a wonderful day today. Welcome to BVJ's Bedtime Stories. My name is Big Voice J, and this is a show where we get you ready for a great night's sleep with some old familiar stories that you haven't heard in a while. Links to every story can be found in the show notes at our website, bedtimewithbvj.com. Tonight's story, Hot Potatoes by Arnold Bennett. It was considered by certain people to be a dramatic moment in the history of musical enterprise in the Five Towns when Miss Swan opened the front door of her house at Bleak Ridge in the early darkness of a November evening and let forth her son Gilbert. Gilbert's age was nineteen and he was wearing evening dress, a form of raiment that had not but too happened to him. Over his elegant suit was his winter overcoat, making him bulky, and around what may be called the rim of the overcoat was a white woolen scarf, and the sleeves of the overcoat were finished off with white woolen gloves. Under one arm he carried a vast inanimate form, whose extremity just escaped the ground. This form was his violoncello. Fragile as a pretty woman, ungainly as a nave, and precious as honor. Mrs. Swan looked down the street, which ended to the east in darkness and a marl pit, and up the street, which ended to the west in Trafalgar Road and electric cars, and she shivered, though she had a shawl over her independent little shoulders. In the five towns and probably elsewhere, when a woman puts her head out of her front door, she always looks first to right and then to left, like a scouting Iroquois. And if the air nips, she shivers, not because she is cold, but merely to express herself. For goodness sake, keep your hands warm, Mrs. Swan enjoined her son. Oh, said Gilbert with scornful lightness, as though his playing had never suffered from cold hands. It's quite warm tonight which it was not. And mind what you eat, added his mother. There, I can hear the car. He hurried up the street. The electric train slid in thunder down Trafalgar Road and stopped for him with a jar, and he gingerly climbed into it, practicing all precautions on behalf of his violoncello. The car slid away again towards Bursley, making blue sparks. Mrs. Swan stared mechanically at the flickering gas in her lobby and then closed her front door. He was gone. The boy was gone. Now, the people who considered the boy's departure to be a dramatic moment in the history of musical enterprise in the Five Towns were Mrs. Swan, chiefly, and the boy, secondarily. And more than the moment, the day, nay, the whole week, was dramatic in the history of local musical enterprise. It had occurred to somebody in Hanbridge about a year before that since York, Norwalk, Hereford, Gloucester, Birmingham, and even Blackpool had their musical festivals. The Five Towns, too, ought to have its musical festival. The Five Towns possessed a larger population than any of these centers, save Birmingham, and it was notorious for its love of music. Choirs from the Five Towns had gone to all sorts of places, such as Brecknock, Aberystwyth, the Crystal Palace, and even a place called Hull, and had come back with first prizes, cups and banners, for the singing of choruses and part songs. There were three, or at least two and a half, rival choirs in Hambridge alone. Then also the brass band contests were famously attended. In the five towns, the number of cornet players is scarcely exceeded by the number of public houses. Hence the feeling, born and fanned into lustiness at Hambridge, that the five towns owed it to its self-respect to have a musical festival like the rest of the world. Men who had never heard of Wagner, men who could not have told the difference between a sonata and a sonnet to save their souls, men who spent all their lives in manufacturing teacups or china doorknobs, were invited to guarantee five pounds apiece against possible loss on the festival, and they bravely and blindly did so. Being conducted to conduct the preliminary rehearsals of the festival chorus had an acute attack of self-importance, which by the way, almost ended fatally a year later. Double crown posters appeared magically on all the hoardings announcing that a festival consisting of three evening and two morning concerts would be held at the Alexandra Hall at Hanbridge on the 6th, 7th, and 8th November. 
and that the box plan could be consulted at the principal stationers. The Alexandra Hall contained no boxes whatsoever, but box plan was the phrase sacred to the occasion and had to be used. And the festival more and more impregnated the air and took the lion's share of the columns of the Staffordshire Signal. Every few days the Signal reported progress, even to intimate biographical details of the singers engaged and of the composers to be performed, together with analyses of the latter's works. And at last the week itself had dawned in exhilaration and excitement. And early on the day before the opening day, John Marazzi, the renowned conductor, and Herbert Milwain, the renowned leader of the orchestra, and the renowned orchestra itself all arrived from London. And finally, sundry musical critics arrived from the offices of sundry London dailies. The presence of these latter convinced an awed population that its festival was a real festival and not a local make-believe, and it also tranquilized in some degree the exasperating and disconcerting effect of a telegram from the capricious Countess of Chell, who had taken six balcony seats and was the official advertised high patroness of the festival, announcing at the last moment that she could not attend. Mrs. Swan's justification for considering, as she in fact did consider, that her son was either the base or the apex of the splendid pyramid of the festival, lay in the following facts. From earliest infancy, Gilbert had been a musical prodigy, and the circle of his fame had constantly been extending. He could play the piano with his hands before his legs were long enough for him to play it with his feet. That is to say, before he could use the pedals. A spectacle formerly familiar to the delighted friends of the swans was Gilbert, in a pinafore and curls, seated on a high chair, topped with a large Bible and a bound volume of the graphic, playing Home Sweet Home with Thalberg's variations, while his mother, standing by his side on her right foot, put the loud pedal on or off with her left foot according to the infant's whispered orders. He had been allowed to play from ear, playing from ear being deemed especially marvelous, until some expert told Mrs. Swan, until some expert told Mrs. Swan that playing solely from ear was a practice to be avoided, if she wished her son to fulfill the promise of his babyhood. Then he had lessons at Kniep, until he began to teach his teacher. Then he said he would learn the fiddle, and he did learn the fiddle, also the viola. He did not pretend to play the flute, though he could. And at school, all the other boys would bring him their penny or even sixpenny whistles, so that he might show them of what wonderful feats a common tin whistle is capable. Mr. Swan was secretary for the Taft and Brickworks and Colliery Company, Limited. Mr. Swan had passed the whole of his career in the offices of the prosperous Toft End Company, and his imagination did not move freely beyond the company's premises. He had certainly intended that Gilbert should follow in his steps. Perhaps he meant to establish a dynasty of swans, in which the secretaryship of the 20% paying company should descend forever from father to son. But Gilbert's astounding facility in music had shaken even this resolve, and Gilbert had been allowed at the age of 15 to enter, as assistant, the shop of Mr. James Otkinson, the piano and musical instrument dealer and music seller in Crown Square, Hambridge. Here, of course, he found himself in a musical atmosphere. Here he had at once established a reputation for showing off the merits of a piano, a song, or a waltz, the customers male and female. Here he had thirty pianos, seven harmonium, and all the new and a lot of classical music to experiment with. He would play any piece at sight for the benefit of any lady in search of a nice, easy waltz or reverie. Unfortunately, ladies would complain that the pieces proved much more difficult at home than they had seemed under the fingers of Gilbert in the shop. Here, too, he began to give lessons on the piano. And here he satisfied his secret ambition to learn the violoncello, Mr. Atkinson having in stock a violoncello that had never found a proper customer. His progress with the cello had been such that the theater people offered him an engagement which his father and his own sense of the enormous respectability of the Swans compelled him to refuse. But he always played in the band of the Five Towns Amateur Operatic Society and was beloved by his conductor as being utterly reliable. His connection with choir started through his merits as a rehearsal accompanist, 
who could keep time and make his bass chords heard against 150 voices. He had been appointed Nem Khan, rehearsal accompanist to the festival chorus. He knew the entire festival music backwards and upside down, and his modestly expressed desire to add his cello as one of the local reinforcements of the London Orchestra had almost been had almost been eagerly complied with by the advisory. Nor was this all. He had been invited to dinner by Mrs. Clayton Vernon, the social leader of Bursley. In the affair of the festival, Mrs. Clayton Vernon loomed larger than even she really was, and this was due to an accident, due to a sheer bit of luck on her part. She happened to be a cousin of Mr. Herbert Milwain, a leader of the orchestra down from London. Mrs. Clayton Vernon knew no more about music than she knew about the North Pole, and cared no more. But she was Mr. Milwain's cousin, and Mr. Milwain had naturally to stay at her house, and she came in her carriage to fetch him from the band rehearsals, and in short, anyone might have thought from her self-satisfied demeanor, though she was a decent sort of woman at heart, that she had at least composed Judas Maccabeus. It was at a band rehearsal that she had graciously commanded Gilbert Swan to come and dine with her and Mr. Milwain between the final rehearsal and the opening concert. This invitation was, as it were, the overflowing drop in Mrs. Swan's cup. It was proof to her that Mr. Milwain had instantly pronounced Gilbert to be the equal of London cellists and perhaps their superior. It was proof to her that Mr. Milwain relied on him particularly to maintain the honor of the band in the fest. Gilbert had dashed home from the final rehearsal, and his mother had helped him with the unfamiliarities of evening dress, while he gave her a list of all the places in music where, as he said, the band was rocky, and especially the cellos, and a further list of the smart musical things that the players from London had said to him, and he had said to them. He simply knew everything from the inside, and not even the great Marazzi, the conductor, was more familiar with the music than he. And the ineffable Mrs. Clayton Vernon had asked him to dinner with Mr. Milwain. It was indubitable to Mrs. Swan that all the festival rested on her son's shoulders. It's freezing, I think, said Mr. Swan, when he came home at six o'clock from his day's majestic work at Toft End. This was in the bedroom. Mrs. Swan, a comely little thing of thirty-nine, was making herself resplendent for the inaugural solemnity of the festival, which began at eight. The news of the frost disturbed her. How annoying, she said. Annoying? questioned blandly. Why? Now you needn't put on any of your airs, John, she snapped. She had a curt way with her at critical times. You know as well as I do that I'm thinking of Gilbert's hands. No, you must wear your frock coat, of course. All that drive from the other end of the town right to Hambridge in a carriage? Perhaps outside the carriage because of the cello. There'll never be room for two of them, and the cello, and Mrs. Clayton Vernon in her carriage. And he can't keep his hands in his pockets because of holding the cello. And he's bound to pretend he's not cold. He's so silly. And yet he knows perfectly well he won't do himself justice if his hands are cold. Don't you remember last year at the town hall? Well, said Mr. Swan, we can't do anything. Anyway, we must hope for the best. That's all very well, said Mrs. Swan, and it was. Shortly afterwards, perfect in most details of her black silk, she left the bedroom, requesting her husband to be quick, as tea was ready. And she came into the little dining room where the youthful servant was poking up the fire. Jane, she said, Put two medium-sized potatoes in the oven to bake. Potatoes, Mum. Yes, potatoes, said Mrs. Swan tartly. It was an idea of pure genius that had suddenly struck her, the genius of common sense. She somewhat hurried the tea, then rang. Jane, inquired, are those potatoes ready? Potatoes, exclaimed Mr. Swan. Yes, hot potatoes, said Mrs. Swan, tart. I'm going to run up with them by car to Mrs. Vernon's. I can slip them quietly over to Gill. They keep your hands warm better than anything. Don't you remember when I was a child? I shall leave Mrs. Vernon's immediately, of course, but perhaps you'd better give me my ticket, and I will meet you at the hall. Don't you think it's the best plan, John? As you like, said Mr. Swan, with the force of habit. He was supreme in most things, but 
In the practical details of their son's life and comfort, she was supreme. Her decision in such matters had never been questioned. Mr. Swan had a profound belief in his wife as a uniquely capable and energetic woman. He was tremendously loyal to her, and he sternly inculcated the same loyalty to her and Gilbert. Just as the car had stopped at the end of the street for Gilbert and his violoncello, so, more than an hour later, it stopped for Mrs. Swan and her hot potatoes. They were hot potatoes, nay, very hot potatoes, of a medium size, because Mrs. Swan's recollections of youth had informed her that if a potato was too large, one cannot get one's fingers well around it, and if it is too small, it cools somewhat rapid. She had taken two, not in the hope that Gilbert would be able to use two at once, for one cannot properly nurse either a baby or a cello with two hands full of potatoes, but rather to provide against accident. Besides, the inventive boy might, after all, find a way of using both simultaneously, which would be all the better for his playing at the concert, and hence all the better for the success of the musical festival. It never occurred to Mrs. Swan that she was doing anything in the least unusual. There she was, in her best boots, and her best dress, and her best hat, and her sealskin mantle, not easily to be surpassed in the town, and her muff to match, nearly, and concealed in the muff were the two very hot potatoes. And it did not strike her that women of fashion like herself wives of secretaries of flourishing companies, do not commonly go about with hot potatoes concealed on their persons. For she was a self-confident woman, and after a decision she did not reflect, nor did she heed minor consequences. She was always sure that what she was doing was the right and the only thing to do. And to give her justice, it was, for her direct, abrupt, common sense was indeed remarkable. The act of climbing up into the car warned her that she must be skillful in the control of these potatoes. One of them nearly fell out of the right end of her muff as she grasped the car rail with her right hand. She had to let go and save the potato, and begin again while the car waited. The conductor took her for one of those hesitating, hysterical women who are the bane of car conductors. Now, missus, he said, up with ye. But she did not care what manner of woman the conductor took her for. The car was nearly full of people going home from their work of people actually going in a direction contrary to the direction of the musical festival. She sat down among them, shocked by this indifference to the musical festival. At the back of her head had been an idea that all the cars for Hambridge would be crammed to the step, and all the cars from Hambridge forlorn and empty. She had vaguely imagined that the thoughts of a quarter of a million people would that evening be centered on the unique musical festival. And she was shocked also by the conversation. Not that it was in the slightest proper, but because it displayed no interest whatsoever in the musical festival. And yet there were several festival advertisements adhering to the roof of the car. Travelers were discussing football, soap, the weather, rates, trades. Travelers were dozing. Travelers were reading about starting prices. But not one seemed to be occupied with the musical festival. Nevertheless, she reflected with consoling pride. If they knew that R. Gilbert was playing cello in the orchestra and dining at this very moment with Mr. Milwayne, some of them would be fine and surprised that they would. No one would ever have suspected from her calm, careless, proud face that such vain and twopenny thoughts were passing through her head. But the thoughts that do pass through the heads of even the most common-sense philosophers men and women, are truly astonishing. In four minutes, she was at Bursley Town Hall, where she changed into another car, full of people equally indifferent to the musical festival, for the suburb of Hillport, where Mrs. Clayton Vernon lived. Put me out opposite Mrs. Clayton Vernon's, will you? She said to the conductor, and added, You know the house. He nodded, as if to say disdainfully, in response to such a neat question. Do I know the house? Do I know my pocket? As she left the car, she did catch two men discussing the festival, but they appeared to have no intention of attending it. They were earthenware manufacturers. One of them raised his hat to her, and she said to herself, He at any rate knows how important my Gilbert is in the festival. 
It was in the instant that she pushed upon Mrs. Clayton Vernon's long and heavy garden gate and crunched in the frosty darkness up the short winding drive that the notion of the peculiarity of her errand first presented itself to her. Mrs. Clayton Vernon was a relatively great lady, living in a relatively great house, one of the few exalted or peculiar ones who did not dine in the middle of the day like other folk. Mrs. Clayton Vernon had the grand manner. Mrs. Clayton Vernon instinctively and successfully patronized everybody. Mrs. Clayton Vernon was a personage with whom people did not joke. And lo, Mrs. Swan was about to invade her courtly and luxurious house, uninvited, unauthorized, with a couple of hot potatoes in her muff. What would Mrs. Clayton Vernon think of hot potatoes in a muff? Of course, the swans were as good anybody. The swans knelt before nobody. The swans were the cream of the town, combining commerce with art. And why should not Mrs. Swan take practical measures to keep her son's hands warm in Mrs. Clayton Vernon's cold carriage? Still, there was only one Mrs. Clayton Vernon in Bursley, and it was impossible to deny that she inspired awe, even in the independent soul of Mrs. Mrs. Swan rang the bell, reassuring herself. The next instant, an electric light miraculously came into existence outside the door, illuminating her from head to foot. This startled her. But she said to herself that it must be the latest dodge, and that at any rate it was a very good dodge, and she began again the process of reassuring herself. The door opened, and the prim creature, stiffly starched, stood before Mrs. Swan. My word, reflected Mrs. Swan, she must cost her mistress a pretty penny for getting up aprons. And she said aloud, Kurt, Would you please tell Mr. Gilbert Swan that someone wants to speak to him a minute at the door? Yes, said the servant with pert civility. Will you please step in? She had not meant to step in. She had decidedly meant not to step in, for, for she had no wish to encounter Mrs. Clayton Vernon, indeed the reverse. But she immediately perceived that in asking to speak to a guest at the door, she had socially erred. At Mrs. Clayton Vernon's, refined people did not speak to refined people at the door. So she stepped in and the door was closed, prisoning her and her potatoes in the imposing hall. I only want to see Gilbert Swan, she insisted. Yes, said the servant. Would you please step into the breakfast room? There's no one there. I will tell Mr. Swan. As Mrs. Swan was being led like a sheep out of the hall into an apartment on the right, which the servant styled the breakfast room, another door opened further up the hall, and Mrs. Clayton Vernon appeared. Magnificent though Mrs. Swan was, the ample Mrs. Clayton Vernon, discreetly décolleté, was even more magnificent. Dressed as she meant to show herself at the concert, Mrs. Clayton Vernon made a resplendent figure, worthy to be the cousin of the leader of the orchestra, and worthy even to take the place of the missing Countess of Chell. Mrs. Clayton Vernon had a lorgnon at the end of a shaft of a tortoise shell, otherwise a pair of eyeglasses on a stick. She had the habit of the lorgnon. The lorgnon seldom left her, and whenever she was any doubt or difficulty, she would raise the lorgnon to her eyes and stare patronizingly. It was a gesture tremendously effective. She employed it now on Mrs. Swan, as who should say, Who is this insignificant and scarcely visible creature that has got into my noble hall? Mrs. Swan stopped, struck into a mobility by the basilisk glance. A courageous and even a defiant woman, Mrs. Swan was taken aback. She could not possibly tell Mrs. Clayton Vernon that she was the bearer of hot potatoes to her son. She scarcely knew Mrs. Clayton Vernon. It only met her once at a bazaar. With a convulsive unconscious movement, her right hand clenched nervously within her muff and crushed the rich mealy potato it held until the flesh of the potato was forced between the fingers of her glove. A horrible, sticky mess. That is the worst of a high-class potato, cooked, as the five towns phrase it, in its jacket. It will burst on the least provocation. There stood Mrs. Swan, her right hand glued up with escaped potato, in the sober grandeur of Mrs. Clayton Vernon's hall, and Mrs. Clayton Vernon bearing down upon her like a dreadnought. Steam actually began to emerge from her muff. Ah, said Mrs. Clayton Vernon, expecting Mrs. Swan. 
It's Mrs. Swan. How do you do, Mrs. Swan? She seemed politely astonished, as well she might be. By a happy chance, she did not perceive the wisp of steam. She was not looking for steam. People do not expect steam from the interior of a visitor's muff. Oh, said Mrs. Swan, who was really in a pitiable state. I'm sorry to trouble you, Mrs. Clayton Vernon, but I want to speak to Gilbert for one moment. She then saw that Mrs. Clayton Vernon's hand was graciously extended. She could not take it with the right hand, which was fully engaged with the extremely heated sultriness of the ruined potato. She could not refuse it or ignore it. She therefore offered her left hand, which Mrs. Clayton Vernon pressed with a well-bred pretense that people always offered her their left hands. Nothing wrong, I do hope, said she gravely. Oh no, said Mrs. Only just a little matter which had been forgotten. Only half a minute. I must hurry off at once as I have to meet my husband. If I could just see Gilbert, certainly, said Mrs. Clayton Vernon. Do come into the breakfast room, will you? We've just finished dinner. We had it very early, of course, for the concert. Mr. Milwain, my cousin, hates to be hurried. Maria, be good enough to ask Mr. Swan to come here. Tell him that his mother wishes to speak to him. In the breakfast room, Mrs. Swan was invited, nay, commanded by Mrs. Clayton Vernon, to loosen her mantle. But she could not loosen her mantle. She could do nothing. In clutching the potato to prevent bits of it from falling out of the muff, she, of course, effected the precise opposite of her purpose, and bits of the luscious and perfect potato began to descend the front of her mantle. The clock struck seven, and ages elapsed, during which Mrs. Swan could not think of anything whatever to say. But the finger of the clock somehow struck motionless at seven, though the pendulum plainly wagged. "'I'm not too warm,' she said at length, feebly but obstinately resisting Mrs. Clayton Vernon's command. This, to speak bluntly, was an untruth. She was too warm. "'Are you sure that nothing is the matter?' urged Mrs. Clayton Vernon, justifiably alarmed by the expression of her visitor's features. "'I beg you to confide in me if—' "'Not at all,' said Mrs. Swan, trying to laugh. I "'I'm only sorry to disturb you. I didn't mean to disturb you.' "'What on earth is that?' cried Mrs. Clayton Vernon. The other potato, escaping Mrs. Swan's vigilance, had run out of the muff and come to the carpet with a dull thud. It rolled half under Mrs. Swan's dress.' Almost hysterically, she put her foot on it, thus making pulp of the sack potato. What? she inquired innocent. Didn't you hear anything? I trust it isn't a mouse. We have had them once. Mrs. Clayton Vernon thought how brave Mrs. Swan was, not to be frightened by the word mouse. I didn't hear anything, said Mrs. Swan. The untruth. If you aren't too warm, won't you come a little nearer the fire? But not for a thousand pounds will Mrs. Swan have exposed a mush of potato on the carpet under her feet. She could not conceive in what ignominy the dreadful affair would end. But she was the kind of woman that nails her colors to the mast. Hear me, Mrs. Clayton Vernon murmured. How delicious these potatoes do smell. I can smell them all over the house. This was the most staggering remark that Mrs. Swan had ever heard. Potatoes? Very weakly. Oh, yes, said Mrs. Clayton Vernon, smiling. I must tell you that Mr. Milwain is very nervous about getting his hands cold and driving to Hambridge, and he was asked me to have hot potatoes prepared. Isn't it amusing? It seems hot potatoes are constantly used for this purpose, in winter by the pupils of the Royal College of Music, and even by the professors. My cousin says that even a slight chilliness of the hands interferes with his playing. So I am having potatoes done for your son, too. A delightful boy he is. Really, said Mrs. What a good idea. She might have confessed then, but you do not know her if you think she did. Gilbert came in, anxious and alarmed. Mrs. Clayton and Vernon left them together. The mother explained matters to the son, and in an instant of time, the ruin of two magnificent potatoes was at the back of the fire. Then, without saluting Mrs. Clayton and Vernon, Mrs. Swan fled. I know we like to get caught up in some big event and we think everybody's all hyped up about it and uh, it turns out that they might not be.
Life goes on for a lot of things and a lot of people. And a lot of people are interested in all kinds of things. If you find yourself interested in things, you might... If you find yourself interested in a lot of things, you might try kindling your interest by learning about more of them with a good audiobook from audible.com. They've got all kinds of books on all kinds of subjects that you can listen to whenever you want. And a BVJ and a promo code and it would do absolutely nothing for this is not a sponsored read. I would like to remind you that we're always on the lookout for great public domain stories to feature on the podcast. Email me, bigvoicej at gmail.com. Don't forget to give us a review on iTunes to help spread the word. Thank you so much for listening. Good night. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>